Well, good morning, brethren. Happy Feast of Tabernacles to all of you. I hope everyone's having a wonderful feast this year, no matter where you may be. And as always, I'd like to start off by saying a special hello and greetings to some special ladies, to Nancy Miller, to Jean Ward, to Daisy Swint, to Martha Frederick, and to Marcia Suckling. Happy feast to all of you. And also a wonderful feast greetings to Bruce Metzger and Teresa Metzger and John Alvarado down in Monterey, Mexico. Hope everyone again is having a wonderful feast. It is indeed a, a wonderful time of the year. You know, brethren, the Bible is full of vivid descriptions of human traits and characteristics by the reference of different animals in the Bible, such as the industriousness, industriousness of the ant, the wisdom of the serpent, serpent the gentleness and the harmlessness of a dove, and a mother hen protecting her chicks. Also in the Bible, we read of many examples of animals which are used to personify and represent people or things. We have examples of the dove representing God's Holy Spirit. We have examples of Jesus, the Anointed One, being the Lamb of God. We can read of the many examples of our adversary, as being a dragon or a serpent or a lion looking for whom he can devour. The devil is portrayed in that way. We also read of false believers being wolves in sheep's clothing. The Bible is full of animals representing things and people. But Jesus used two animals in particular to describe the called out ones of our Heavenly Father and the followers of his way of life. And those two animals are sheep and goats. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. You know, these verses are some of my favorite scriptures, and they form the basis of the words of the song, Come Ye Blessed, which was a mainstay of choir music in the churches of God in the past decades. In these verses, Jesus presented a great difference between sheep and goats. We read this in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21, 31. In verse 31, we read, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or fed you, or thirsty, and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and took you in, or naked, and clothed you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. That was the sheep on the right hand. Then he turns, and then shall he say unto them on the left hand, These are the goats. Depart from me, you cursed, and into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord... When did we see you hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
You know, brethren, from these verses, we can ascertain very quickly that there is a significant difference between the sheep on the right side of Jesus and the goats on the left side of Jesus. And the difference can mean the difference between being in our Heavenly Father's kingdom and not being in His kingdom. Today, brethren, in my sermon entitled, Are You a Sheep or a Goat? I would like to explore the subject of sheep and goats, their characteristics and their implications for us in our spiritual lives. More importantly, how does our Heavenly Father see us? See each and every one of us. Does He see us as sheep or as goats? And in the end, our Heavenly Father's point of view of us is the only one that truly does matter. I would like to explore this subject by contrasting five characteristics of sheep and goats and by determining which animal best represents our personal attitudes, our personal behavior, and our personal commitment to our Heavenly Father's way of life. Brethren, the first characteristic to be compared between sheep and goats is characteristic number one is gregarious behavior. Point number one is gregarious behavior. Webster's Collegiate Dictionary defines the word gregarious as habitually living or moving in flocks or herds, tending to flock or herd together, wanting to be together. Gregarious behavior is a term given to reflect the herding or flocking instincts of animals. Now, many animals are gregarious. The majority of birds will flock together. You know, during the autumn and spring of the year here in Houston, we find thousands and thousands and thousands of birds flying in the air and walking around on the ground in different places in the city. The parking lot in a nearby Walmart store is literally covered in thousands and thousands of birds. These birds are everywhere. They're on the parked cars, they're on the parking lot itself, or circling above in the sky. They're just everywhere. They're covering everything. And when a huge group of birds take flight at the same time, the, the sky just grows dark. And when the birds fly, they fly in a perfect pattern and in a perfect motion that moves up and down and side to side, right to left, just as if their flight were being orchestrated. You know, gregarious behavior applies to other animals such as bees, ants, termites, cows, and horses. And this gregarious behavior also applies very much to sheep. There's a big difference between sheep and goats in this characteristic of gregarious behavior. Sheep are intelligent and are smart at things that are good, noble, and just. They remember the faces of up to 50 people, uh, 50 other sheep and certain humans for two years. For up to two years. Sheep have a strong tendency to follow, and they usually follow a shepherd. In his article, A Special Lamb, John Eliot writes, Being gregarious social animals, sheep love the company of their kind and become easily stressed, separated, or alone. Consequently, sheep tend to congregate closely together and move as a group. In their creation, our Heavenly Father and Jesus made the sheep's only defensive strength to be an intimidation they give when bunched tightly together. By nature, sheep have a strong follow tendency. A leader among them is often just the first one to move. There are no prima donnas among the flock. None trying to gain a following, take from another, and no one insisting that he or she is better than others. Unquote. Now, goats, on the other hand, are generally not followers. This behavioral quality is rather weak in goats. Goats do not have a gregarious behavior. Instead of flocking together and following, goats prefer to lead or to go wherever they want. Many times they're loners because the gregarious instinct is weaker in goats Goats tend to go it alone. Please turn with me to Hebrews 10. 
And we will read an exhortation concerning the importance of congregating and fellowshipping together as the called out ones of our Heavenly Father. We read this in Hebrews chapter 10, and starting in verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. In Hebrews 10, verse 23, we read, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, our Heavenly Father's Holy Spirit is what binds us together. We in the churches of God have come from different origins, whether they be social, economic, linguistic, national, racial, ethnic, or religious. You know, without the calling of our Heavenly Father and without His intervention in our lives, most of us would not even know each other. And we definitely would not be friends. But here we are, a very diverse group, united and joined together by His Spirit. Brethren, do we look forward to being with our Heavenly Father's spiritual children? Are we excited to come together and to be together each Sabbath, even if it's by phone call or by long-distance communication? Is the Sabbath and the interaction with called out ones something that we look forward to? Is being together with our Heavenly Father's called out ones important to us? Is it of great importance to us? This reminds me of an age-old saying, which is, If it is important to you, you will find a way. And if it's not, you will find an excuse. If it is important to you, you will find a way. And if it's not important to you, you will find an excuse. When it comes to opportunities to fellowship with God's people, do we find a way or do we find an excuse? Brethren, being spread out of, around the country and the world like we are, many of us are by ourselves. We don't have congregations to attend. Most of us worship our Heavenly Father on the Sabbath, by ourselves, or in very, very small groups. Most of us are separated by distance from one another. For many of us, the Feast of Tabernacles is the only time during the year that we can actually come together to fellowship and worship together, in person with one another. But because of finances, health, age, and other issues, many of us cannot attend the Feast of Tabernacles in person this year at the feast site. And even for those who have gathered here in Washington State for the feast, the group fellowshipping here in person is very small in number. But brethren, regardless of the physical barriers that we may have, do we still desire to come together as a group? as friends, as family, as spiritual brothers and sisters on the Sabbath and during the week, by phone calling one another, by video conferencing one another, by text messaging one another, by emailing one another, or by writing one another. Are we yearning for fellowship, or are we desiring to go it alone? Brethren, in the characteristic of gre gregarious behavior, are we sheep? Or are we goats? The second characteristic to be compared between sheep and goats is, characteristic number two is loyalty. Characteristic number two is loyalty. You know, brethren, sheep need and desire a shepherd. It's innate, in, innate in them. Sheep are loyal to the shepherd who guards them and protects them and provides for them and cares for them. Sheep recognize the voice of their shepherd. Other voices that are unfamiliar to them can actually frighten the sheep. In his book, Animals of the Bible, John Worcester writes that, quote, The shepherds of the East give a name to each member of their flocks, which the sheep soon learn, and to which they instantly respond. 
In the dry season, many shepherds with their flocks meet at regular times around the wells. The flocks intermingle at the troughs, drinking. But when all are satisfied, the shepherds move off in different directions, calling their sheep, which immediately follow. Everyone its own sheep uh, to its own shepherd with scarcely the possibility of a mistake. So here are all these sheep inter intermingled, and the shepherds take off in different directions, and every sheep follows the voice of his shepherd. John Worcester further writes, quote, It is not uncommon in our country for single lambs to receive names and to be petted when they become models of trustful obedience toward their master, but remain timid toward a stranger. Our sheep, however, rarely have a shepherd's care, being confined by walls and fences. Instead of a shepherd, they attach themselves to one of their own number, who acts as their leader, and whom they follow as trustfully as they would their master. With neither shepherd nor leader, they are distracted and scatter in every direction. It is a peculiarity of sheep that while they are so easily led by one whom they know, they are driven with difficulty. They huddle together as if frightened, and the more they are pressed, the more they are driven, the more frightened they seem. But if the leaders start forward, then the flock naturally follows. You don't drive sheep. The sheep follow the shepherd. They're not like cattle that have to be driven. Please turn with me to John 10. Just as sheep need and desire a shepherd, we as called out ones of our Heavenly Father need and desire a shepherd to lead us, to guide us, and to protect us. We read this in John chapter 10. And we'll begin in verse 1. John chapter 10 and verse 1. These are the words of Jesus. John 10 verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. So, just as in life, shepherds lead their sheep, and the sheep follow the voice that they know. And Jesus, the anointed one, is our good shepherd. Let's continue to read in John 10, in verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he is he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The hireling flees because he's a hireling and cares not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus, the anointed one, is our shepherd. He is the good shepherd, and he was willing to die for his sheep. Jesus is not a hireling who did not care for his sheep. Let's continue in John 10, in verse 25 of John 10. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. But you don't believe because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. And then verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So we as his sheep hear Jesus' voice and we loyally follow him. Again, sheep are very loyal. Goats, on the other hand, are not loyal. In his article, Goats on the Left, Mike Ford writes, quote, A goat follows only his own lead, creating disunity when he comes in contact with others in the flock. 
Because of his independent nature, he often finds himself in contention with the shepherd for leadership of the flock, leading some astray. Unquote. Brethren, goats are not loyal to their flocks, neither are they loyal to other animals and to the shepherd. Ranchers will place an old goat, appropriately named a Judas goat, among the sheep in order to lead and control them. Ranchers and meat packers, using the gregarious instinct of sheep to their benefit against the sheep, will use a Judas goat to lead the sheep into trailers in order to be transported to the slaughterhouse. In the document, The Judas Goat Phenomenon by Hysterio.com, we read that, quote, Sheep ranchers sometimes use a Judas goat to manage their sheep. The goat is trained to go out a gate, through a chute, up a ramp, and to the bed of a cattle truck. Sheep, being sheep, are inclined to follow anything that looks like it knows where it's going. So they follow the Judas goat into the truck. And the tr after the truck is full, the ranchers take the Judas goat out and place it back into the pen, ready to lead another group of sheep into another truck. Un of course, the Judas goat gets its name from Judas, the betrayer of Jesus. The connection is that the Judas goat betrays the sheep by appearing to be a friend the same way Judas betrayed Jesus. Unquote. Now, brethren, with that in mind, please turn with me to Proverbs 20, where we'll read about loyal loyalty. And I'll read this in the New Living Translation. Proverbs 20, and we'll read verse 6. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 6. In Proverbs 20, verse 6, we read, Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? Brethren, are we loyal? Are we loyal to one another? Are we loyal to our families? Are we loyal to our friends? Are we loyal to the brethren in the church? More importantly, are we loyal to God our Father and to His Son? During the week, do we waver and fail in our loyalty to our Heavenly Father as the result of our actions, our thoughts, our emotions, and our attitudes? Do we ever pray that He would just give us a loyal attitude in our lives? King David did just that. He prayed for loyalty. He prayed to Jehovah that He would have a loyal heart for our Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to Psalm 51. When King David was at the low point of his life, after having had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba, after having orchestrated the, the murder and death of Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, and after having suffered the death of his son, David cried out and prayed that Jehovah would renew a loyal spirit in him. And we read this in the New Living Translation and in Psalm 51 and verse 10. Psalm 51 and verse 10. We read the prayer of David. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. A loyal spirit that would be willing to obey Him. Brethren, do we ask our Heavenly Father in our prayers that He renews a loyal and steadfast spirit in us, a loyal and steadfast mind in us, an attitude in us, that we will be willing to follow Him in anything and everything. Please turn with me to Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus was talking to His disciples, instructing them on many aspects of life. We read this in Matthew 16 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. We read, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, brethren, taking up our cross 
means that we decide to be loyal to Jesus, the Anointed One, and to God our Father. No matter what the difficulty may be, no matter what the sacrifice may be, no matter what the price may be, it doesn't matter. We must follow Him because of our loyalty. Our loyalty must be firm and resolute. Please turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, where we'll read a discussion between Jesus and a rich young man on the subject of loyalty. Mark chapter 10, and we'll begin in verse 17. A very famous and well-known encounter. Mark 10 and verse 17. And when he, Jesus, was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God, or the God, which is the Father. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor your father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, I have done all these all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. But the result in 20, verse 22 is, And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now, brethren, unfortunately, the young man, had, rich man, had limits on his loyalty to Jesus. When what Jesus demanded of him exceeded that threshold, the rich young man turned away and did not follow Jesus and his way of life. His loyalty had limits. Brethren, are we loyal to our Heavenly Father and to Jesus, His Son, in all aspects of our lives, without limit. Is anything in our lives more important to us than our Heavenly Father and our relationship with Him? In the life of the rich young man, riches were more important to him than his relationship with God our Father and his Son was. In our lives, what are the things that will prevent our total loyalty to our Heavenly Father? Do we place limits on our own loyalty to Him? Brethren, in the characteristic of loyalty, are we sheep or are we goats? The third characteristic to be compared between sheep and goats is characteristic number three, contentment. Characteristic number three is contentment. You know, brethren, sheep are satisfied and are content animals. They are content to graze together all day in a pasture. They are content having a shepherd who leads and protects them. Sheep do not normally fight among themselves or push one another around. However, goats are very much not like this. In his article, Goats on the Left, Mike Ford writes, quote, If goats are not poking their heads through fences... They may be standing on their hind legs, stretching for those tender leaves just out of reach. Goats are never content with what they have. In his book, The Animals of the Bible, John Worcester writes, quote, Goats differ from sheep in being capricious, often mischievous, curious, and meddlesome. They are loud and peremptory, peremptory in their cries, unquote. No, brethren, goats are always looking for something better, something juicier, something greener. Goats are truly never satisfied with what they have. Brethren, are we satisfied? In the, this aspect of our lives, are we more like sheep or like goats? The Apostle Paul wrote about this aspect in Philippians 4. Please turn with me to Philippians 4. Another set of very well-known verses. Philippians chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 11. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul writes, 
Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in what, uh, whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed full, both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, brethren, Paul had the spiritual, emotional, and mental maturity to be content in whatever circumstance that he found himself in. Paul endured many trials and afflictions in his life. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 11, and we'll read about the afflictions of the Apostle Paul. He did not have an easy life, and yet he was content. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23... 2 Corinthians 11, and beginning in verse 23. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23, Paul writes, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths off. Of the Jews, five times I received forty stripes, except, save one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A day and night I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and in nakedness, besides those things that are without that which comes upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Paul did not have an easy life. He did not have a comfortable life. But in spite of all these sufferings, deprivations, and afflictions, the Apostle Paul was still content. However, Paul apparently had a severe trial of a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. The Bible never tells us what that thorn in the flesh was. But Paul truly desired to be alleviated of this affliction. We read this in 2 Corinthians 12, just the very next chapter. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, Paul writes, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know, although Paul prayed diligently about that, God our Father did not take away the thorn in the flesh of Paul. Instead, Paul was told that he should be content and that the grace of his heavenly Father was enough. Sometimes we've prayed for an extended period of time that our Heavenly Father would take away a severe trial or a severe problem from our lives. What would we do if God our Father's answer to our prayer was the answer that He gave to Paul? Would we remain content? Please turn with me to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13 we read a very important exhortation concerning contentment. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. In Hebrews 13 verse 5 we read, Let your conversation or your, your conduct be without covet covetousness, and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Brethren, the question to ask is, what do we need to be content? What will make us content? Contentment is a state of mind which comes from our Heavenly Father. 
Contentment cannot be dependent on what we have or what we receive or what we achieve or what we are striving for. We can be content having very little physically or having health problems or financial problems. And we can be unhappy and not content and absolutely miserable having incredible riches and health and wealth. Brethren, in the characteristic of contentment, are we sheep or are we goats? The fourth characteristic to be compared between sheep and goats is characteristic number four, stubbornness. Characteristic number four is stubbornness. You know, again, sheep are very docile. Sheep are not obstinate animals. They follow when, when led by a shepherd or by a leader in the flock. Sheep are compatible animals. You know, however... Goats are not like sheep in this characteristic at all. In his article, Goats on the Left, Mike Ford writes, quote, Goats also possess a stubborn streak. A friend once tried to move a goat in a certain direction. He grabbed it by the horns and pushed and pulled and tugged. And no matter how or in what direction he tried to move the goat, it resisted. He could not budge it one inch. Then when he let go, it just trotted off in the direction that the goat wanted to go in, unquote. You know, the majority of unconverted people are like goats in this characteristic. People generally just want to do their own thing. They want to do, they want to do their own thing in the way that they want to do it. Most people desire everything to be, be done the way they want, when they want, and where they want. That's just human nature that comes from our adversary. Led by the influence of our adversary, the devil, they are willful and obstinate. Man without the Spirit is willful and obstinate. Please turn with me to Romans 8. The unconverted mind is totally against our Heavenly Father and battles constantly against Him. We read this in Romans 8 and verse 7. Very, very well-known verse. Romans 8 and verse 7. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 7, we read, Because the carnal mind is enmity or hostility against God, the God, Hotheos, God our Father. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, God our Father, for it is, is not subject to the law of the God, God our Father, neither indeed can be. So the natural mind, under the sway of our adversary, is hostile, is actually hostile against our Heavenly Father. Please turn with me to 1 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul described this animosity between the unconverted mind and the mind of our Heavenly Father. We read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and we'll read verse 14. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, Paul writes, But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, of the God, of the Father. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So brethren, to an unconverted mind in the world, the truth and all the things of our Heavenly Father and of Jesus are just foolishness. Please turn with me to Psalm 78. Psalm number 78, where King David wrote, about an obstinate and rebellious generation. Much was written about that certain generation. And we'll read about it in Psalm 78 and verse 5. In Psalm 78 and verse 5, David wrote, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. 
and verse 8, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. You know, that obstinate and rebellious generation was ancient Israel during the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. They were a stubborn and rebellious generation. Please turn with me to Exodus 32. During the time that Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments and other instructions from Yehovah on Mount Sinai, the Israelites were fabricating and worshiping a golden calf. What did our Heavenly Father say to Moses? We read this in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 7. Exodus 32 and verse 7. And Yehovah said unto Moses, Go and get you down, for your people which you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be your gods, O Israel, which have brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Yehovah said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. They were a stubborn bunch of people. God our Father was ready to destroy all of Israel because of their stubbornness and rebellion, but Moses intervened and pleaded for mercy for Israel. And Yehovah then spared the Israelites from a certain death. Please turn with me to Deuteronomy 9. Forty years later, the Israelites were ready to cross the Jordan River and to enter the Promised Land, and Yehovah once again spoke concerning the stubbornness of the Israelites. We read this in Deuteronomy chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verse 1. We read, Hear, O Israel, you are to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fenced up to heaven. And then in verse 6, Understand, therefore, that Yehovah your God gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. You're stubborn. Remember and forget not how you provoked Yehovah your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you did depart out of the land of Egypt until you came into this place, you have been rebellious against Yehovah. You know, brethren, like the Israelites, are we obstinate toward our Heavenly Father? Are we stubborn? Are our actions and our attitudes and our thoughts and our, and our minds, are we rebellious against Him? Or are we docile in the hands of our Heavenly Father, our great Creator, just like a, a sheep is with their shepherd? Are we like His Son Jesus what was at the end of His life? Please turn with me to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. Again, when Jesus was in agony at the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing what awaited Him in just a few hours, that He would be mocked cruelly, that He would have to endure the unbearable pain of being whipped and scourged just short of death, and that He would have to be crucified and ultimately killed. He still prayed that His Father's will would be done. And we read this in Luke 22 and verse 41. Luke chapter 22 and verse 41. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you be willing, remove this cup from me. He really didn't want to die and to suffer as a human. But then he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You know, Jesus humbly submitted to the will of his Father, even when he, as a human, did not desire the outcome. Brethren, do we have that type of relationship with our Heavenly Father? To trust Him that much, to have that much faith in Him, and to walk humbly with Him, to put His will before our will. Brethren, showing humility and seeking our Heavenly Father's will, not our own will in our lives, is the opposite of stubbornness. 
Brethren, in the characteristic of stubbornness, are we sheep or are we goats? Now, the fifth and final characteristic to be compared between sheep and goats is characteristic number five, testing boundaries. Characteristic number five is testing boundaries. You know, whenever a flock of sheep enters into a new pasture, the sheep tend to move together to a location in the pasture where the leader of the flock stops. This is not the case with goats. Goats generally will run, will run along the fences and or boundaries in which they are put. A good friend of mine who works on a ranch told me that whenever a goat is put into a field or pasture, the first action that the goat does is to run around and find the boundaries. The goat will run along the fence, testing and probing to determine if there are any openings in the fence. Now, once again in his article, Goats on the Left, Mike Ford states, quote, Goats are experts in opening gates and squeezing through small gaps because they hate to be confined. Fences that will handle sheep, cattle, and horses will not hold goats. They will work tirelessly to spring themselves from any situation they deem inhibiting. Goats are capricious. They are in they are impulsive and unpredictable, devious and contrary. When they are grazing, it is not unusual to see several with their heads through a fence, straining to reach the grass that is always greener on the other side. Unquote. Now, brethren, God our Father gives us boundaries. These boundaries are defined by our Heavenly Father in His Ten Commandments, listed in Exodus 20. Do not have any foreign gods before me. Do not worship idols. Do not use Jehovah's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. And do not covet. Brethren, those are boundaries. But these boundaries are not black and white. They are, there are many colors of gray. And the Father allows it to be that way. Please turn with me to Matthew 5. Jesus explained that he came to magnify the law in order to include the intent of the heart. Not just the physical act or action. In Matthew 5, starting in verse 19... Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, You shall not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. <clears throat> but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, you fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna fire. So then if we have hatred in our heart towards someone, we are breaking the sixth commandment, even though we have not physically killed that person. Let's skip down to verse 27. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said by them of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her commits adultery with her already in his heart. Again, we have the spiritual aspect of this to the heart. It says, If we have lust in our heart towards someone, we are breaking the seventh commandment, even though we have not had physical relations with that person. All of us want to know where the boundaries are. However, many in the churches of God in the past wanted to know where the boundaries were. And after knowing the location of these boundaries, exactly like goats, they approached as close 
and as, po as possible to that boundary or to that fence, so to speak. Is this a Christian attitude? Is this what our Heavenly Father desires from us? Is that the attitude He wants? You know, goats approach a boundary that they cross, and they cross it with a defiant attitude. But sheep are satisfied staying together in the middle of the pasture or in the middle of the field together, never getting close to the fence or the boundary, never craving what was on the other side of the fence. Brethren, sheep view boundaries as protection. Goats, however, view boundaries as constraints that they try to cross time and time again. Again, to repeat, sheep view boundaries as protection, but goats, however, view boundaries as constraints that they try to cross time and time again. Brethren, in the characteristic of testing boundaries, are we sheep or are we goats? Brethren, in today's sermon, we have explored five characteristics of sheep and goats. They are characteristic number one, gregarious behavior. Do we love to come together in Christian fellowship as sheep? Or do we desire to go our own way and do our own thing like goats? Characteristic number two, loyalty. Are we loyal to our shepherd, Jesus the Anointed One, like sheep? Or do we lead the called out ones of our Heavenly Father away from the flock like goats? Characteristic number three, contentment. Are we satisfied with what we have like sheep are? Or are we never satisfied, never reaching and positioning or never always reaching and always positioning ourselves for something else or something more like goats. Char characteristic number four, are we uh, stubbornness. Are we following the will of our Heavenly Father like sheep, or are we following our own will like goats? And characteristic number five, testing boundaries. Are we content to stay within the fences and the boundaries that our Heavenly Father has put forth to us like sheep? Or are we continually testing and probing those fences and boundaries? And in fact, are we crossing those fences and boundaries like goats? Brethren, there are tremendous differences between the characteristics of sheep and goats. There is a reason why God our Father chose the Lamb to represent His Son, Jesus the Anointed One. The qualities of a lamb and of a sheep are the qualities that our Heavenly Father desires for us to inculcate in ourselves, in our spiritual lives. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13 and we'll read where the Apostle Paul exhorted the Corinthian brethren to examine themselves. And we read this. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Paul writes, Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Examine yourselves. Brethren, we are here today celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, a feast that we look forward to each year in great anticipation. During the remainder of the feast, let's examine ourselves where we are in the faith, where we are in our Heavenly Father's high calling, and where we are on our, on our own personal path towards salvation. Let's examine ourselves in these five characteristics of sheep and goats to help determine where we are in our relationship with our Heavenly Father and where we are on our path towards spiritual salvation and entry into his kingdom. Brethren, I end my sermon with the following question. By the way that you are living your life today, by the way that you are setting an example for others, by the way that you are treating others, by the way that you are showing kindness, generosity, and forgiveness to others, by the way that you are showing respect, awe, and obedience to our Heavenly Father, and to His Son, Jesus. And by the way that you are deepening your relationship with our Heavenly Father, 
Are you a sheep or a goat? And more importantly, how does our Heavenly Father see you? Brethren, does our Heavenly Father see you as a sheep or does He see you as a goat? Brethren, our very spiritual lives and our spiritual futures and our entry into our Heavenly Father's kingdom are dependent on the answer to that question.